is an Avengers level threat. Spider-Man Far From Home is a long-awaited breath of fresh air, because after what seems like an endless slew of these massive superhero movies with massive everything, we finally get a film that keeps itself much smaller and intimate. Unfortunately, while keeping things small is what made Far From Home so great, it's also what ultimately became its downfall. If you didn't hear, what happened was that this movie flopped at the box office hard and ended up losing Sony a lot of money. Oh wait, that's not actually true. It made more money than some of the most massive comic book movies you'll find. And that's because this entire film is a lie. Like I said, Far From Home at heart is a small movie. It focuses more on character than plot. It bases its conflict more on trivial internal stakes than hugely significant external stakes. Honestly, it feels less like a real summer blockbuster and more like a tiny indie road comedy. Which makes sense since the director here comes from that corner of filmmaking. But the usual downside to this is that no matter how great rate your character project is, if it's not a big film, it will not make the big bucks. The harsh truth is, we as an audience have been conditioned to only go see these massive blockbusters with world or galaxy ending plots and threats. And that's why I have to give credit to Sony and Marvel, because what they managed to do here was take this tiny indie film and disguise it as a massive billion dollar blockbuster, in such a blunt way that the whole thing is actually a very smart meta commentary on the issue where talking about. When Tony Stark is gone. There is a window of opportunity and someone will step up. But these days, you can be the smartest guy in the room, the most qualified, and no one cares. Unless you're flying around with a cape or shooting lasers from your hands, no one will even listen. Well, I've got a cape and lasers. Naturally, there's a lot of reversals and twists in Far From Home, but that's not what I mean here. What I mean is that the very key things that made this movie sell in the promotional material, in the theater experience, it's all a lie. The evil larger-than-life villain, lie. The massive action sequences with world-threatening dangers, lie. The movie in general being played off as this big plot-driven superhero flick, lie. And what baffles me the most, considering that we live in an age where the term subverting expectations has received a negative connotation, is that despite this film basically cheating the audience for two hours straight, it's one of the best MCU entries that pretty much everybody enjoyed. Which is the reason for this video. Let's look at Spider-Man Far From Home and see how exactly it takes this tiny indie project and deceives the audience into viewing it as a billion dollar blockbuster, in a way that still leaves the audience smiling and satisfied. In the promotional material, Mysterio was initially sold as a hero. Iron Man and Thor rolled into one, which did make him seem pretty cool. Who is that guy? I don't know, but he's kicking that water's ass. But honestly, him not being the real villain was a bit too dumb for anyone to actually buy into. Although with Sony, you never really know for sure. The real lie, however, comes from the fact that as a villain, Mysterio is actually nothing as promised. We have this super destructive, super dangerous, larger-than-life antagonist who can fly and shoot lasers and whatever, and then at the midpoint turns out that all he is is just a dude in a mocap suit controlling a bunch of drones. Like... What kind of big blockbuster bad guy is that? All I have to do is get on the inside of the illusion, then I can take it down, find him, and he's just a guy. First of all, I'd argue that being a powerless nobody actually is what makes Mysterio aka Quentin Beck such an amazing villain. Because instead of being yet another addition to the never-ending list of larger-than-life super evil comic book bad guys, he by default has to be more of a layered personal antagonist. The crux of Beck's character is that he's a brilliant mind who feels he's been wrongly neglected and hidden away from the spotlight. And now it's his mission to finally make everyone see and appreciate him the way he deserves. And even though this mission is the furthest thing from your usual larger-than-life blockbuster villain objectives, it's more than enough. Because Beck is living proof that in order for a villain to be effective, they don't need to be powerful or larger-than-life. All they need is to be obsessively motivated. Which is a pretty fitting term to use here. Hey, kill it. Just kill the illusion. Kill no, it. No, I'm not gonna kill it. They'll see They'll see what I want them to see! You still need the cape. Yes, Janice. I still need the cape. Why aren't these drones firing? You're in the strike zone. The chance of getting no, hit is- No, fire all the drones now! 
The danger of Mysterio doesn't come from the fact that he's evil. He doesn't want to kill Spider-Man. He doesn't want to kill Spider-Man's friends. The danger of Mysterio comes from the fact that he is so destructively obsessed in his mission that he's willing to do and sacrifice anything to fulfill it, including Spider-Man and his friends. As in, we have as strong of a hero-villain conflict as any massive blockbuster, but in a way that gives us a villain who is more tangible and unique. A villain that doesn't just have to take over the world, but instead only has to make the world see him. How could you do all this? You'll see, Peter. People tend to believe. But even though the villain twist here does bring up great results, it doesn't change the fact that the Mysterio we were promised was nothing but a lie, which also has a clear business reason. If this movie had been honest and told in the trailers that Mysterio is actually just a normal dude with a bunch of drones, odds are it would not have made a billion dollars. Considering that aside from just Nolan's Batman sequels, no live action superhero movie with a normal real life dude as the opposition has ever done so. And the problem this lie very easily creates is that it ends up leaving the audience dissatisfied and not so happy. But the thing is, that's never the case here. Because everything this movie does, it always organically ties to the character. The sequences of Mysterio flying around fighting the elemental monsters, they're not there just to look cool in the movie and in the trailers. They're there because Beck has to manipulate Spider-Man into viewing him as a friend, which pays off at the midpoint reveal. The nightmare vision sequence at the empty building, it's not there just to be visual visually astonishing. It's there because Beck has to manipulate Spider-Man into revealing which of his friends know about him, which pays off right after. The ending battle sequence of Beck unleashing the monster and trying to kill Spider-Man's friends, same thing, just more manipulation and protection of the mission. I could go on, but what I'm getting at is this. Quentin Beck is the real villain of Far From Home, and Mysterio is a tool he uses to fulfill his plans. Whatever Mysterio does, it always serves a bigger purpose, and that's why even though Mysterio was nothing but an unreal lie, it doesn't feel like it. As was evident back in the trailers, Far From Home has a bunch of gigantic and very high stakes action sequences where Spider-Man has to fight these elemental monsters. We have the water monster battle, which is about saving the city of Venice. We have the fire monster battle, which is about saving the entire planet. We have the London monster battle, which is also very much about something larger than life, because, well, I mean, look at it. And while massive CGI sequences like these aren't necessarily what interests everyone, the truth is that with the more common audiences, this grand world-ending stuff is how you sell a movie today, especially internationally. Make sure every drone is weapons hot, we need maximum damage. <laughs> this is gonna cause a lot of casualties. Oh yeah, more casualties, more coverage. I gotta cut through the static. I mean, if I'm gonna be the next Iron Man, I need to save the world from an Avengers-level threat. But as we've already discussed, none of this is real. The monsters aren't real, the stakes aren't real, the battles aren't real. It's all just another lie by the filmmakers. Spider-Man doesn't actually have to defeat the monsters. There's nothing significantly horrible that happens if he doesn't, other than maybe a few buildings being destroyed. And so, when the reveal comes and when the movie ends, what by logic should happen is that the audience will look back and view this as a movie without stakes and be like, eh, that was kinda pointless. But the reason that's not the case here is because none of it actually is pointless. I mean, I'm not someone who usually is the biggest fan of massive fight scenes with shallow CGI monstrosities, but even I thought the battle sequences here were great. Why? Why? Because the lie that this movie utilizes is not to cover up the fact that there are no stakes, but instead in a flashy way to mask and build on what the real stakes are. In the Venice fight, for example, Spider-Man's actions against the water monster are inconsequential. There's nothing he can do to stop it, because it's not a real monster that's really trying to destroy the city. But that's okay, because the stakes don't come from stopping the monster from destroying the city. They come from controlling the collateral damage that Mysterio's fake fight is causing. Spider-Man has to stop bystanders from being killed. He has to give everything he has to stop a building from turning his entire class into pancakes. Those are the obstacles. Those are the stakes. Look at the fire monster sequence. The proposed stakes are that if the monster reaches the first wheel, it will be strong enough to blow up the whole planet. And since that's not actually a real thing, does that then mean that this whole sequence is for nothing? It would be, if not for one, saving grace. Night monkey! Yeah. Night Monkey, help! Night, Night Monkey! Save us! What? Night Monkey, we're stuck! Oh, no, no. Help us! Help! 
The monster and the world's destruction might not be real, but as we've learned, the collateral damage as well as Beck's unhealthy obsession for authenticity are. If Spider-Man doesn't play by Mysterio's rules well enough and also keep the destruction away from the first wheel, his friends are going to fly home in caskets. As in, the true stakes of preventing the monster from reaching the first wheel might not be exactly as this movie proposes, but they are still there in the same way, just in different form. Same with the ending battle. At this point, we already know that the monster isn't real, but that's not the point. Spider-Man isn't trying to stop Mysterio to save London, but instead to save his closest friends who Mysterio is actually visually trying to kill. Those are the stakes. And even though they're smaller and less flashy than promised, I'd argue they actually carry much more of an impact. Because even though saving London from a CGI monstrosity might sell tickets, saving someone close to you from an obsessive psychopath will always be more tangible and emotional and powerful. All the big action sequences in this movie might be deception, but only in the sense of what they are truly about. Spider-Man is never just a passive inconsequential bystander. His actions always carry meaning. And that is why, lie or not, these sequences do as well. So far, we've talked about more specific aspects of deception in this movie, but for the final point, I want to talk about it in the sense of the movie as a whole. Like I said in the beginning, Far From Home at Heart is a tiny indie road trip romantic comedy about a boy going after a girl. The furthest thing from a massive ever exhilarating blockbuster you can get. There are no real external goal heavy plots. There are no real external objectively significant obstacles. There's just 16 year old Peter Parker wanting to have a fun time on his school trip and get a chance to spend time with MJ. That's it. But since movies where characters just wanna do stuff and have a good time aren't usually big box office giants, the filmmakers had to find a way to disguise it as this hugely important superhero thrill ride. And weirdly enough, that might be the very thing that makes it such a great film. What do you want, Peter? What do you mean? What do you want, you, Peter Parker, now? I know you're thinking about I it. I wanna go on my trip, right? I wanna go back on my trip with my friends and go to the top of the Eiffel Tower with the girl who I really like and tell her how I feel. Peter Parker wants this movie to be just a small-scale rom-com, but his responsibility as Spider-Man is constantly pulling him away from that want and towards a big blockbuster where he needs to accomplish these incredibly significant larger-than-life objectives, which results in the movie consisting of a bunch of these small character-oriented scenes that are dressed up to be about big external obstacles. For example, the scene where Peter accidentally calls in a drone strike on their bus. On the outside, this scene is about Spider-Man saving his friends from being blown to bits, which is pretty cool and exhilarating. But at the core, it's actually just about 16-year-old Peter Parker trying to stop another kid from showing a discriminating photo of him to MJ that would ruin his chances with her. As in, we have the heart and the personal impact of a smaller character movie coupled with the thrilling and excitement-heavy shell of a big action blockbuster. But this combination isn't there just to make the film and its scenes look big. Bigger. It's also there to make them feel bigger. Wanna go in on a pair? You mean let's sit next to each other? Yeah. I'll save you a seat next to me because I'm also out of seats, so I'll be up there. Okay. <laughs> Parker! Look at the scene where Peter can't sit next to MJ in the theater because he has to go be Spider-Man. In a blockbuster sense, this moment is very meaninglessly trivial. Oh no, you couldn't sit next to a girl. Kid, you're both high schoolers, none of this matters anyway. But because this is a high school movie at the core, because we always play by the rules of a high school movie, it does matter. It is a heartbreaking moment. And it also boosts the emotional impact of the bigger Spider-Man action sequences later on, because we feel just how massive of a toll it takes for Peter to fulfill his responsibilities. I mean, look at the arc that Peter in this film goes through. On the outside, it's about him as Spider-Man finding his powers and fighting the monsters and Mysterio and saving the world and whatever. But at the core, what it's really about is him as Peter Parker learning to make his own decisions and grow up to be his own independent adult. That's what this movie is. That's what gives this movie the power and the emotion that it has. The outside layer 
here is just a way to dress that story up in the form of a box office blockbuster. The whole world is asking who's going to be the next Iron Man. I don't know if that's me happy. I'm not Iron Man. You're not Iron Man. You're never going to be Iron Man. The one thing that he did that he didn't second guess was picking you. I don't think Tony would have done what he did if he didn't know that you were going to be here after he was gone. And actually, the more that I think about how Far From Home does all this, it's not even really deception. It's not really lying. What it is, is something that every big Hollywood film should aspire to feature in the same way. Heart of a small emotional character piece, shell of a thrilling blockbuster. A thing called good storytelling.